Well, welcome to this classic online service. It's great to be with you wherever you are watching right now. And if you are new to joining us online or you would like to connect beyond worshiping together online like we're doing right now, uh, we'd love for you to let us know that. We'd love to uh, make that happen. And, and you can do, help make that happen by, by just going to our website, fpclakeland.org. Right up at the top, there's a tab that says, I'm new. You click on it. There's a place to put in some information. Fill in that information, and then we will reach out to you. We'd love to be in community with you beyond this. Well, today, uh, we will be having the Lord's Supper. So we'll be having communion together. Well, you can see the table behind me is, is set it's part of this service today. Uh, it's coming up a little bit later on in the service. Uh, and so uh, we will be joining you and you will be joining us at this table today. And if you have not already done so, this would be a good time to go and gather bread and gather, gather juice to be ready to have a communion together when that time comes in this service in just a little while. Well, several things I want to uh, highlight for now, and, and one, I want to let you know that uh, Sunday, October 9th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in the chapel next door, if you can make it, if you're around, our own Renee Hawk will be doing a one-woman show called Journey to Forgiveness. It's a portrayal of the life of Corey Ten Boom, who had, um, who was survived the concentration camps. Uh, she and her sister, who passed away in the concentration camp, but just the story of her coming to terms with forgiveness after all that she uh, went through. Powerful, powerful story. If you don't know the story at all, well worth coming and seeing it uh, as a reminder to us of the importance of forgiveness. Second, I want to let you know that it's that time of year for our outreach uh, that we have for, for the community called Costumes and Candy. We have over a thousand people who, who walk around the church and look at the different stations where different people are dressed up in costumes handing out candy. And uh, it's just a great event for our community. And uh, here's the question for you. Uh, two, the, two questions, really. One is, will you set up a display? And will you hand out candy? So if you're in the Lakeland area and you can and you and are able, please do. Uh, and then secondly, if you maybe you do both, but if you can uh, help provide that individually wrapped candy just by having that sent to the church or dropped off at the church. If you can do either one of those or both of those things, please contact the church office and let us know. And finally, um, we are continuing on in this series on living hope, and we continue to ask the question of you, what is it you hope for most in life and in the future? Can you name what it is you hope for most? Many have been doing this, and it's been great to read the hopes of the people of this church. And we're just going to ask you to keep responding. Uh, if you haven't done so already, you can send your, your hopes in to, by email to hope, H-O-P-E, at fpclakeland.org. Org. And again, we're going to compile them and, and let them sort of make their way into the liturgy and the music and the messages in this series. Well, that's it for now. As you listen to this prelude music, I ask you to still your hearts and prepare your minds to worship God. <laughs>
Having prepared our hearts for worship, let us now participate in the call to worship from Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Indeed, let us worship God. Every creature rise and bring honors peculiar to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. May we be among those whose worship brings peculiar honors to our King. And so let our gifts go well beyond the casual and be gifts from the heart. In the context of online worship, you may give through our church website, you may give by way of text. 
And you may give certainly the old-fashioned way by mail. However you choose to give in the context of worship, may you find great joy giving to the one who has given everything to you.
join me in prayer. We ask now, O oh God, that you would accept the offerings from our hands, that they may promote peace and goodwill and advance the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We offer these gifts to you in faith and in gratitude for the love that you have shared with us, even as we yearn to see our neighbors receive the same. Be honored in our worship, O oh God. We pray now for our preacher, Dr. Fullerton, as he proclaims the gospel to us. Grant him grace and boldness and give him the words of the gospel that we might recognize and be drawn to the dwelling place of God with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. During Hurricane Ian, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law in Fort Myers sent videos of their home throughout the afternoon and the evening of the of the hurricane and they sent videos as long as they they were able to send videos and it's the the each video is like worse and worse steadily worsening damage and eventually having all this flooding on the first floor of their elevated house i mean it was my carol and my sister-in-law said it was waist deep on ground level and it was four six inches or so on the first level of their of their house and they're safe now uh, they're they're well now but but she said it was just terrible i mean they it was so relentless that's what she said that we just couldn't wait for it to stop but when will this ever end and i thought about that because lakeland here in lakeland we had wind gusts of about 80 miles an hour and i was up at one o'clock in the morning i was watching and i was listening it was intense well fort myers had 140 mile an hour non-stop constant wind with gust well beyond that i just i just can't imagine what that was like uh, they spent the night uh, in the second floor of their house wearing life preservers that's how bad it got we have been through a hard week here in florida and you know weeks before the hurricane that hit here three days ago i had chosen this old testament passage for today and when I went back and looked at it, now having gone through the storm and then thinking about what people who are going through who are getting ready to have round two of the storm, I read these words entirely differently. I see them through the lens of what we've just been through. Listen to the words of Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. And the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Now, that is a psalm about the glory of God. It's about the power of God. It's about the supreme position over God, of, of, over all the earth of God, even over the storms, even over the water. And knowing that this is so, the psalmist is saying it gives people strength and blesses them with peace. And I can tell you that my family in Fort Myers has strength. They're a bit shell-shocked, but internally where it matters the most, they trust in the Lord. And they're getting through this. They are getting through this. And we are all getting through this. And one of the things, I've seen great things come out of this storm already. So Thursday morning, the first thing I did Thursday morning after the eye of the hurricane passed by us was to walk our property, check out like everybody else did, the damage around our property. We had minor damage, branches and things like that. The second thing I did was drive up to the church and check out the inside of the church. Elder Jason Rada had already driven by and sent some photos of damage outside of the church. So I wanted to, to go to check out the inside of the church. And on my way to the church, I saw my neighbor and 
church member Brian Blanchard helping his neighbor haul debris out of his yard. So what I saw right away, right after the storm, was the people of the church who were already doing what we do best, caring and supporting others. And I've heard many stories since then of the same thing happening by you, the people of this church. Across the street from from my house, neighbors gathered together to help a neighbor take down a 36-inch laurel oak that had fell on on our neighbor's house. It was they couldn't tell, but the tree was rotted on the inside. So we were all out there. I put my little battery-operated chainsaw to work there, and and not only there, but then four other houses all around mine. We just chopping up and taking care of each other's yards. And, and then we took another tree, an 18-inch tree down that was leaning against my daughter and, and son-in-law's house. And then here at the church, a part of our steeple was damaged and the rain leaked in the balcony. I can see the, the leak area in the balcony right now. And the paint is beginning to pucker uh, up there. The welcome center has a leak uh, as well. And of course, the grounds, if you saw the pictures, they were a mess. But here's the thing. Being a part of the church is the best. It really is the best. Because on Friday morning, dozens of people descended upon the church with wheelbarrows and tarps and rakes and chainsaws and a heart and a desire to help. And adults and young adults and youth and children, even toddlers, were all working together, doing all the work to get the church ready to to have church. And the youth hauled away these large pieces of branches. I'm up there with a chainsaw trying to cut them into, I'm trying to cut them into to chunks of that, that I would carry. But they're just like, oh, our youth were strong. And they're hauling away these large you know, pieces of wood that had fallen down. And let me just brag on the children for just a minute. I asked Joe Ahern, our children's ministry director, to have the children clean up what is to my right here, the memorial garden. It was a mess. Like everything else, it was a mess. But yesterday there was a memorial service, and part of it was to be in the columbarium, in the memorial garden. And the children and Miss Joe, they were the best. They turned what was a mess into something beautiful, and they did it knowing that it would bless a grieving family. In fact, uh, there's such great motivation for everyone who showed up. Everyone who, who cleaned up yesterday, uh, or, or on Friday did so because they knew that this place matters, because God's... People worship here and they serve here and they and they grow here. It's just great. Which brings me to really today's theme. Today is about being the church. It is about us being the church. It's about who we are as a church. It is about how we are to think about ourselves as a church and why we are to think of ourselves as a church. We are a household of God. We are a family. We are living together under the headship of Jesus Christ, whom you will hear described in the scripture passage today as the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of the church. We are a spiritual house of people doing ministry and offering praises to God. Now, Peter has been uh, busy working on some problems that the, that the people at the time were experiencing because we're going through this letter to First Peter, uh, of First Peter, letter written to churches who are filled with people who are going through difficulties. And he knew that the people who would hear these words read to them were struggling and they were struggling in their lives. They were struggling just to be a Christian. They were struggling. People were harassing them because they were a Christian. People were persecuting him because they were a Christian. And Peter is writing to encourage them by reminding them of this greater picture. As happens with all of us in life, in the middle of the crisis, in the middle of the hurricane, it is often difficult to see and to remember the larger truth. And so Peter brings that larger truth to them. He reminded them that they were people of a new birth, this new internal change of their condition. He reminded them that this new birth gave them this living and sustaining and ongoing hope, regardless of of any difficulties that they may be experiencing in the moment. He reminded them of all that all this was taking them somewhere. It was taking them toward an inheritance in heaven from God And then he said that 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 affected how they lived. It helped them with the difficulties. It inspired them to leave behind their evil desires that they had before they, they they were Christians. It reminded them that they were to pursue holiness above everything else. And then today, 
He reminds them that all of this happens as they live their life together as a holy people, as a spiritual house. And it's a reminder to them and a reminder to us as well. Now, before I read the passage, I want to share one thing with you, one talk about one thing with you, because you're going to hear several references to rocks and stones, rocks and stones. So last week, if you were here, if you were part of this message, you know we left off with the verse saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. So Peter is using this metaphor. Uh, he presented the Lord as, uh, as food. Well, today uh, he presents the Lord as a rock or as a stone. So, so one scholar, uh, Norman Hillier, he has this, this rock stone imagery. He says this, it was a messianic title among the Jews as well as among uh, Christians. So this rock stone imagery is something that the Jews and the Christians used to speak of the Messiah. And for us as Christians, it was a way of, of talking about Jesus, Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the anointed deliverer. So here, for example, here's several ways, several images that are built into this passage. Like Isaiah 8, chapter, four, chapter 8, verse 14, there's an image of, uh, of the, an anointed one, a deliverer, who will cause people to stumble for rejecting God. Well, Peter speaks of this uh, for those who reject Jesus. The passage in Isaiah says he will be a holy place. Both, for both Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Jesus, for Peter, is the stumbling stone for those who reject him. And then there's another image in Isaiah 28, 16. And in this one is to say that, that the Lord is the sure foundation of a person's life. And Peter uses it to say that Christ is that sure foundation. But Isaiah 28, 16 says this. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Or there's another image. There's an image of a parental rock image in Isaiah 51.1. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. There's another, there's a building usage with the rejected but vindicated stone. Peter uses again to refer to Christ, but originally coming out of Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then there's a supernatural stone of Daniel 2.34. There's divine meaning given to, the, to ordinary things. Daniel says this, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. And then there is this burdensome stone of Zechariah 12:3, indicating the immovable nature of a city built on God. He said, on that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. And all who try to move it will injure themselves. So what all this is saying, this is a lot of different imagery. I'm trying to give you the, a picture of the different ways this imagery is used. But Peter is using the image of Jesus as the stone or the rock or the living stone or the cornerstone or the rejected stone. And, and he then says that they, the people hearing this letter being read to them, they are built on Jesus, who is that living stone, who is that cornerstone, who is that rejected stone. And again, keep in mind Peter's intention. He wants them to be encouraged. He wants them to have hope in the midst of their difficult moments. And so he writes this in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 8. Now, this now is the passage for today. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And 
a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So Jesus is the living stone upon which the faith of the people is built. Jesus was the rejected stone, as many people certainly did reject him, ultimately killing him. He's the rejected stone, but God chose him. Jesus was the cornerstone in that he is the solid foundation of the faith of the Christian. He was the stumbling block in that those who rejected him suffered the losses of what could have been between them and God. He was the, he was the stumbling block. But as the rock and as the living stone, and this meant that his people, those who follow Jesus, the church itself, the people of the church, they became something special, incredibly special. That's what verse 5 was all about. Verse 5 that says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Those are the praises of the people. That you are a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offering praises acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, all of that then he echoes in the next section of 1 Peter, verses 9 and 10. He says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Listen to that list. Did you catch all that? He's telling the people, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Again, who's he writing to? Well, he's writing to a group of people who were struggling in the faith. They were struggling in their lives. And what is he saying? That they are not to forget who they are as a people. They are chosen by God for salvation and for serving in this world. They are royalty and that they are children of the king of all kings. They are priesthood, meaning that every single Christian then and now is part of a new priestly order. Everyone is a priest. Now, that, that doesn't mean the same thing that it does, say, in the Roman Catholic churches. I like how one scholar described this. It's this sense of being priest. It means that every Christian has immediate access to God, that he or she serves God personally, that he or she ministers to others, and that he or she has something to give. We, he says, are a royal priesthood. We, together, as a people of faith, make up this larger identity of being a holy people, or as Peter says it, a holy nation. And we are God's special possession. This is exactly what was, what was said in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. This is after the God had delivered the people out of slavery. He says this to them. Now, if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do you hear those words right out of that into, into 1 Peter? And all of this was for Peter to say, that this grounding of our identity, being named as a people cherished and chosen by God, calling us a spiritual house, all of that comes with a purpose. We are a people who are to live for and to make known the glory of God. We are a God-centered people. We are a God-first people. And that affects everything that we do. Everything we do, including how we see the world around us, including how we respond to what happens in this world, including things like hurricanes. See, Peter reminds them that they have a unique identity, a unique identity that recognizes Jesus as the cornerstone, as the very foundation upon which they are to build their lives. The rest of the world, now you know this already, the rest of the world rejects that identity and they claim something else to be more central to them. But our identity, our identity in Christ trumps all other possible choices of defining identities. 
Now, may, you may know this. Identity is a big buzzword these days, and and, and I'm 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 a bit impatient with this with this, especially when believers, Christians, are making some other identity in their lives more central to than our identity in Christ. Look, we are living stones that make up a spiritual house built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That is our defining identity. Not our sports teams, and not our nationalities, and not our ethnicities, or our politics, or anything else. Out of that identity in Christ, we live, and we move, and we have our being. It is the central defining quality about us. Look, Brian Blanchard helping his neighbors... That was not just him being a nice guy. He is a nice guy. It wasn't just him being a nice guy. He was motivated by the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ to sacrifice his time, his own time, to serve others. That's what was driving all that. All those stories that I've heard about you doing all these things with your neighbors and with your community, it's the same motivation for us as believers. Those children who are being trained as they, as they cleaned out the memorial garden for a grieving family, that, the, that, that they were trained. This was all done out of their identity in and their love for Jesus Christ. And those dozens and dozens of people who cut and cleared and hauled and raked and did all that around this, this property, they did so because they are part of this spiritual house and they know this matters to God. You and I are part of the greatest entity ever. The spiritual house of the Lord, built on the cornerstone, built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and inspiring us to make a positive, uncommon impact on the world all around us. So yes, it's been a big week. But yes, we are the spiritual house of God. And especially on a day like today, when we come to the communion table with believers all around the world on this day, the call is for us to be, to be the spiritual house of God now and all of our life. Will you pray with me? May all that we do and all that we say and all that we think be honoring of you, our foundation and our cornerstone, Lord Jesus. May this world be a better place as we serve in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Having heard the gospel proclaimed, let us now affirm our faith together using these words from the Apostles' Creed. Join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning... We will be celebrating World Communion Sunday by participating in this together with Christians from all over the world. And so together, let us now read this section from our Confession of 1967 that addresses what the Lord's Supper is. The Lord's Lord's Supper Supper is a celebration of the reconciliation of men with God and with one another, in which they joyfully eat and drink together at the table of their Savior. Jesus Christ gave his church remembrance of this dying for sinful men so that by participation in it, they have communion with him and with all who shall be gathered to him, partaking in him as they eat bread and drink wine in accordance with Christ's appointment. They receive from the risen and living Lord the benefits of his death and resurrection. They rejoice in the foretaste of the kingdom, which he will bring to the consummation at his promised coming, and go out from the Lord's table with courage and hope for the service to which he has called them.
Indeed, brothers and sisters in Christ, all you who have repented of their sin and placed their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, you are all invited to this table. And so come and celebrate, enjoy communion, rejoice, and thus proclaim to the watching world that Jesus Christ is Lord. And because we have communion with a holy God, all who let us revoke our sin, the pride that so easily besets us in the context of love and the assurance of forgiveness in the covenant sealed in Christ's blood. We will use the prayer which is uh, going to appear on your screen. So let us pray together. Malice, Malice, deceit, deceit, and and hypocrisy hypocrisy have have no no place place amongst our fellowship, and yet they are woven into the fabric of our culture. We confess that we have corrupted the power of anger and distorted the truth. We have turned to that which is base to accomplish goals that were rooted in sin. We repent of treating our neighbor with contempt. We long for the pure spiritual milk that leads us to salvation. As those who once were not your people, who had not received mercy, we rejoice that now your and have received mercy. Amen. Well, hear the word of God as it is proclaimed to us in Peter's first epistle. As you have come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our acceptance and our forgiveness are assured in Jesus Christ. Behold, you are a new creation. You are living a new life. And because you are forgiven, live your life now to the fullest. Let us sing to the glory of our forgiving God. with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks and praise. Join me in prayer. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. In the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. And therefore, we praise you, O God, joining our voices with choirs of angels with prophets and apostles and martyrs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. We ask you to remember your church. We ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear that we might be your congregation in this city. And by your spirit, renew our participation in the church. Let justice and peace prevail. 
Father, we ask that you remember the world of nations. We pray for those who are under the direct influence and suffer the effects of Hurricane Ivan. We pray for those in Mexico and in Cuba and in Florida. We pray for those displaced, for those who are losing homes, for those who have lost family members and pets. We pray for those who will be without water and food and power. By your Spirit, renew our participation in the world through generosity. Let peace and justice prevail. We ask you to remember the sick and the suffering, the aged and the dying. We lift up to you those who are on our prayer list, those who have significant and immediate needs. We lift up to you those who are receiving the best care in the world. We lift up to you those who are excluded from care because of poverty. By your Spirit, renew our participation in the healing of the world. Let peace and justice prevail. And hear our prayer of gratitude for those for whom death is no more, where there is no sorrow or crying or pain, for the former things have all passed away. In the waves of the pandemic, in the ravaging of disease, in the wake of this hurricane, you have brought forth peace. So by your Spirit, renew our participation in grief as those who hold fast both to the reality of our loss and the reality of our hope. And so, triune God, pour out now your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine. Make them to be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now we come to this moment, and again, we are reminded that we are joining with believers throughout this world at this very time. And you have heard the words of consecration of these elements, and they include the elements that, that are there before you, and whether it's in your homes or wherever you are right now. Now hear these words that inaugurated, that instituted these, this very meal. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus sat with his friends. And at that meal, he took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, as we now are all about to do together, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. And so... Wherever you are and whatever the elements are before you, uh, it is time now for us to eat and to drink together. These are the gifts of God for you and for me, the people of God. Let us eat together.
please pray with me. Eternal God, you have made us a people unto yourself. You have called us to be a holy nation, your treasured people, and you have promised to always be present with us. And how good and how generous and how kind it is that you have met us here at this table, your table. At this table, you have nourished your children. And at this table, you have given us a taste of what is to come in the banquet in heaven. And at this table, you've allowed us to have union with you and with the saints of all time and throughout the world. And for all of this, the prayer of our heart is one of deep and unending gratitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord God Almighty. And this we pray to you, Father, through the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit, remembering the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. in peace and remember that by the goodness of God you were born remember that in the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ you have been redeemed remember he walks with you every day to comfort to strengthen and to guide he promised he would lo I am with you always and remember that while others have called you servant he has named you friend and in the strength of that mighty friendship, go forth now to serve in the Master's name until we meet again. May the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.